Hello interwebs and welcome to my channel and we are about to do a review of Star Trek Discovery Season 2 Episode 3 Point of Light. As usual I got my handy dandy book full of notes otherwise known as a notebook. Don't know why I said it that way. And I'm going to just go over the entire episode give a little bit of recap and my thoughts. So, but before I get into that, let me give my thoughts on this episode in general. I thought it was a really nice change of pace. The last two episodes of Star Trek Discovery have been very standalone-ish in opposition to season one, which was super, super uh, serialized. The past two episodes haven't been. Whereas this episode really felt like it was a moving chess pieces into place episode. It definitely didn't feel very standalone. While there was a lot of stuff going on with the Klingon Empire, it was really all about moving characters and getting them into different places and having them set off on different uh, missions, which I, I really did like about this episode. I thought it was kind of nice. It felt smaller, more contained after these sort of big high adventure episodes that we've had the past two episodes. But I think the one negative going for it is if I'm going to like sit down and watch an episode of Star Trek Discovery, I might just to like watch watch one a one-off episode I might watch New Eden or the season premiere but I probably wouldn't stick on this episode um, but I would watch it obviously in like a binge watch sort of thing but it def definitely doesn't stand on its own necessarily except for the Klingon stuff but even that just sort of felt like it was just getting people to get set up to move to different places in the story which is fine there's nothing wrong with that it just uh, doesn't make anything super stand out outside of a couple sequences that I thought were really strong I mean it's a strong episode in and of itself uh, but it doesn't just sort of work on its own which is fine all right so let's just get into the episode and go on uh, one cool thing to quick note is we got a previously on Star Trek Discovery in Klingon which I thought was kind of cool. We got a Burnham personal log, which we, I think we got a few of those in season one, but you haven't really seen them much in season two. So it was kind of nice to sort of see that come up. And obviously Burnham's sort of still upset about like not being able to connect with Spock after last episode. And we see after that moment, uh, Burnham, after almost getting run over by the cadet training program, uh, almost running into her, she got like no warning there. We actually see that Tilly is still struggling with may in her head and that may is becoming much more insistent and a problem to tilly however what is interesting and they didn't really dive into it that much but there's the implication that may is making tilly stronger because she's able to run fast and beat everyone despite having stopped and even beat her own record so that's actually kind of interesting uh i'm curious to see if that's going to be developed any further i mean obviously the events of this episode make it harder but interesting implication there i also quick mention i love the new disco shirts they have uh the same black one but they now have like a symbol instead of just saying disco and they have a white one too which is cool i really kind of want to buy them i have a shit ton of trek shirts if you guys hadn't noticed at this point i kind of want a disco shirt then back on the bridge we get a ship coming up to the discovery we learn it's Sarek's ship uh, and that Amanda is on board and she's there to talk with Burnham about Spock. One quick note that I thought was interesting uh, here, we saw Pike call Awushikun uh, Owo, which is something that Tilly's been calling Awushikun. Uh, she called Awushikun Owo last episode and now Pike's doing it. I thought that was a sort of a cute little small, uh, it's a small little uh, character bit that I kind of like that just they're subtly throwing in there. They don't really have to like beat you over the head with it. That, oh, she's called Owo now. It's just a little small character change that I just, I thought was cute and builds character for um, all of them without having to be overstated. Jumping back to the Klingon Empire, we learn that Lorel is taking control but still has opposition from some of the old guard in the Klingon Empire and that they don't necessarily like Ash Tyler slash Voke because he looks like human even though he is still Voke. I'm still not entirely sure how that works. Is he Voke in an Ash Tyler suit? Is he Ash Tyler that had Voke's memories? It's never clear and I wish they would but I guess we're probably just never going to get a chance to really go into that. They're also all pissed about the red lights. They know about it but they uh, kind of see it as a sign that Laurel is weak. One thing I found interesting here uh, and they kind of do it throughout the episode is they jump back and forth between Klingon and Federation standard and they make like mentions that they're talking in English several times like um, Voke gets angry at Laurel for speaking English to him because he's like you should just speak Klingon and then like one of the Klingon High Council members says like, oh, we should might as well just speak standard now. And it just like felt kind of forced to make them speak English. And then later on in the episode, they had everything subtitled in Klingon, but then they started speaking English and then the subtitles changed to Klingon with, with the implication being that they're still speaking Klingon and not English. So it, it just, they felt like they kind of threw everything in the kitchen sink at like figuring out this, like let's have them speak English and Klingon. And it was just, too much and confused me because I'm like, all right, are they now speaking English or Klingon? 
I don't know. And it was just unnecessarily convoluted. They probably could have just done that English to Klingon text thing once and then stuck in Klingon, except for when they were expressly calling out that they were speaking in English. Just pick an option. I, I get what you're trying to do. So you don't need to like kind of reiterate it and beat me over the head with it and say it a bunch of times. It was a bit annoying. Also, I gotta say the Klingon uh, like council chamber and all the Klingon stuff in this episode looks freaking amazing. I know I say it almost every episode about Discovery, but damn, the set design is phenomenal. Phenomenal here. And then Voke, uh, Ash Tyler rubs the paint off of one of the uh, Klingon's face and we later learned that that was the end. He wanted him to do that, uh, which is a nice little uh, play and twist there. Kind of, kind of fun. Oh, I also like with that storyline when we have Voke talking to Lorel, uh, talking about their relationship and things like that and how whenever Tyler looks at Lorel that he feels a violation. And I really kind of like that they're not glossing over the rape implication of last season. There was this implication of rape and definitely uh, Ash Tyler was definitely dealing with PTSD throughout that season because of that. And it kind of felt weird to me that because of that, he would go with her at the end of last season. So I'm glad that they're not kind of like glossing over that fact that they are kind of dealing with the ramifications of, of rape. And I almost wish they would delve into that a little bit further, but I'm glad that it's, it's at least being brought up. Speaking of which, I'll just go through the entire Klingon story before getting back to the Federation story. Volk contacts Burnham and they have a really sweet conversation, beautifully edited too, by the way. It, it reminded me of the scenes in, not that I like this movie, but it reminded me of the good scenes in Star Wars The Last Jedi between um, Adam Driver and Daisy Ridley when they were kind of looking at each other but weren't in the same space. This reminded me of that. They kind of shot that really interestingly and then that great shot where you see half of one and half the other. Uh, great editing in that scene, great shots in that scene, and a really interesting way to make simple talking back and forth scene really interesting and actually use the editing to sort of say everything about the scene, like when we push in, when we are close to them, when they are sharing the same space in that sort of one shot, when they feel closest, and then when they slowly start moving apart. Brilliantly done editing and brilliantly shot for that episode, for that scene. As we keep going in that storyline, Tyler, uh, learns that he has a child that he had with Laurel. And so he gets really upset about that and sort of like, you should have told me. And there's some really great scenes between, I think almost every scene between Tyler and uh, Laurel are super, super well done. Just really kind of really hitting their relationship on its head and really kind of talking about it in very interesting ways. Cause it's such a unique relationship that they have and showing that he still has feelings for his Vogue, but as Tyler, he really just can't invest in it and he doesn't really know where he sits anymore. And you see these sort of like this push and pull between the two of them and Laurel kind of dealing with that, loving him so much, but then also trying to be this hardened warrior and getting upset and angry, but then also wanting to connect with him so much. It was brilliantly done and both actors just honestly just nailed it. And they nailed it in the scene when they talk about their child and how he wants to raise the child, which only makes it all the more heartbreaking where later uh, the child gets kidnapped and Laurel's uncle gets killed and the old guard Klingon steals the baby and wants to uh, have Laurel sign over the council to him so he can rule the uh, Klingon council. So they go there and there's a wonderful fight scene where Laurel's like, no, and super, super well shot. Like, Damn, that fight scene was brutal and amazing and very Klingon-esque. Exactly what I always thought Klingons should be and how they should be seen. Like I said, I've never been a huge fan of Klingons, but that was just wonderful. Absolutely great scene and really felt Klingon-y. I know sometimes the brutalness of some of the scenes in Discovery doesn't feel very Star Trek-y because it's too brutal, but I think it works for the Klingons very well. But they eventually lose the fight. But then Mir Jojo, who we now know is working for Section 31, uh, shows up and saves both their lives. After they get saved, Giorgio says, look, you can't keep Voke and your child here because they will not be safe and they will also ruin your chances at being Chancellor and you don't really have a choice. Lorel pretends that Voke was a traitor and that their child was killed and calls herself mother instead of Chancellor and so now she sort of regains control of the council and really um, confirms her head of your leadership there. I would have liked to see between Tyler and Laurel. I know it's kind of gives this nice twist like, oh shit, she killed them. And then, but Tyler's actually alive on the section 31 ship. There was such powerful scenes between the two of them that it felt like a missing end cap to her, for her to have made that choice. He really should have made that choice on screen. And we really should have seen that conversation between the two of them about him, him choosing to leave her or her forcing him to leave her. I would have really liked that. And again, I know it's setting up the twist that he's still alive um, and setting up that really great visual of his head and the 
baby head, which was really upsetting. It felt like it was a missing missing scene there. But then we learn on section the Section 31 ship that uh, Emperor Giorgio is recruiting Ash Tyler and that Ash Tyler drops off his child. I do wonder, maybe the child becomes the albino in DS9. I know there was a lot of people that thought that Voke would be the albino. Just a thought, and the albino is not a good dude. Interesting possible connection, though I do hope the child does come back. It would be kind of sad if you just forget about the child for the rest of the series and to just bring the child in for this one episode and then forget about it. Again, I'll have to see what the writers are going to do with that and what their plan is for that. But I really hope it doesn't get dropped because I'd be kind of annoyed that they just sort of bring in a child for one episode and then just never speak of it again. It's just dumb plot points. Remains to be seen. So overall, the Klingon storyline was very good. Back on Discovery, we have Burnham talking with Amanda. I wonder why they're always, they were like whispering in the corridor. Like no one was around. Why do you have to whisper so much? First, we go and talk with Pike. Pike's like, no, we can't open up these files that Amanda stole about Spock's medical history. But then we learn that Spock might have murdered three doctors and is now on the run. And that he might be experiencing uh, from the files after Pike said, you know, open up the files. We need to learn more about Spock. We learn that Spock is experiencing an empathy def deficit, which is otherwise known as psychopathy or becoming a psychopath. It's an interesting setup and I like it. The only thing that has me pausing on it is just because it's Spock. And... Like, I am not someone who believes that everything needs to be sacrosanct and that you have to protect these characters and their legacy. I'm totally down with changing them and manipulating them and doing new things with old characters. I, I'm always down for that. I'm just hoping that they don't ruin Spock in the sense. He's not never been a psychopath and never been so unempathetic to be crazy. It's interesting, and I think it can be done interestingly. I just really think they need to like play it careful with this storyline. I'm curious to see where it's going. This is by no means saying it's bad. I don't hate it. Uh, the groundwork is interesting. I just think it's a very tight rope walk to walk, especially with other fans who are even more like, you can't screw with canon than I am. I'm not super precious about it, but I'm curious to see how they go about it. But we also learned from the storyline that the Red Angels appeared to Spock when he was younger in order to save Burnham. So that's twice now that they've saved Burnham, but it's also what brought Spock into himself. And Amanda saw that as a failing of herself as a mother, that, you know, because he was growing up a Vulcan and Sarek wanted him to be a Vulcan and sort of be emotionless, that Amanda couldn't give him the love that uh, she wanted to go to Burnham. Which actually, by the way, uh, I was watching them like, that sounds familiar. I thought that we talked about that in a previous episode. And I actually remembered that's not from the show. That's actually a storyline from the first book, uh, Desperate Measures, I believe is the name of the first one. There's Desperate Measures and Desperate or uh, Drastic Measures and Desperate Hours. They're so closely named that I can't remember. The first Discovery book, that was actually a plot point in it that uh, Amanda gave all of her love to Burnham and not to Spock because she couldn't because he was um, being raised as a Vulcan. So I'm kind of glad that they're sort of connecting that book in here, taking from it, making it feel like it really kind of connects with the canon of the novels. I'm a huge Star Trek book nerd, as you can tell, so I think that's super awesome. But we also learned that Burnham was the one that actually pushed Spock away, that she did something so bad that she doesn't even want to tell Amanda about it, but she did it in order to try to protect Spock. Again, that's super interesting. I'm curious to see what it is. It's, it's a lot of like teeing things up uh, without really setting it off yet. And that, again, that's fine in this episode, but again, it's just moving chess pieces and giving us some exposition instead of really setting us up for, instead of really giving us anything huge here, which is fine, but it's just a wheels turning bit. But I am super curious to see where that storyline goes. And that's pretty much all we get. We have Amanda, she's gonna go off and try and find Spock. And that's sort of the end of that storyline for this episode. Some really great character moments. I really like the stuff between Amanda and uh, Burnham throughout this and we get like little character pieces of a lot of different people. And the only other major storyline this episode was with Tilly. And so Tilly, she's on the bridge and May, the hallucination in her head, starts freaking out and getting super pissed at the captain because she's angry and the implication is, is that she's angry at Lorca and that she really, really hates Lorca for some reason and wants to go after him, but she doesn't know what he looks like. He just knows that he betrayed them and he's pasty and white. So that basically describes me. Anyways, she gets really upset and causes Tilly to have a breakdown on the bridge and a couple little funny moments uh, there, but played in kind of a sinister way. And I like that sort of subversion of Tilly, how now like her humor is kind of becoming this darker thing underneath and Pike's sort of like, oh, you're speaking less words now. And 
it just it, that whole scene could have been played comically and was played comically uh, in a way because Mary Wiseman is a great comedic actress, but has this sinister edge to it. So I like that they're sort of taking Mary Wiseman's skill as a comedic actress and then really, really kind of doing some new and interesting things with it and sort of playing up her awkwardness. Tilly kind of sits down and has a talk with Burnham and tells her about that. Tilly starts crying and May, the hallucination, doesn't know what crying is, which allows Burnham to realize uh, after Tilly told her about that May didn't know what tears were, Burnham's like, well, that might mean that she's actually not just something out of your head because you would know what tears are. And if it's something out of your head, then that would mean that it would know what your tears are. And there's a funny little line like, oh, believe me, I find me a teenager who hasn't cried. I'm a Xeno and I, I don't even know. It's a weird long word, Xeno anthropologist. Something like that. But it was a funny line, great little beat. I always like Burnham and Tilly character moments. They have a really sweet relationship. I will say my only note here, maybe a bit easy for Burnham to be able to figure it out. Uh, Burnham kind of being like, I know everything and can figure things out super easily. So that's a bit annoying. But then on the other hand, do I really want an episode where I was like, Tilly, you're just fine. And kind of everyone gaslighting Tilly for a whole episode that I've seen a million times before and even in Star Trek, like 10 or 12 times. So there's like a mixed part of me. It's like felt a little easy, yes, but then it would like, well, I'm glad that they kind of didn't go down that road because it would just been an annoying storyline of everyone just being like, no, Tilly, you're totally fine. You're going crazy and Tilly hating yourself and all these things. So I kind of like that finally when she opens up, uh, someone instantly believes her. And that really kind of feels very Star Trek-y to me that someone wouldn't be like, you're crazy. They're sort of more like, oh, Let's take this and actually uh, see what, what this means. Then we learn that um, we find out that May is actually the spore that fell on Tilly's shoulder back in the fin back in the mirror universe, not the finale, but one of the final episodes of last season. And they tear it out and they find it's this weird organism thing that they kind of put in a force field and we'll find out more next episode. But May is clearly pissed off at Lorca for some reason. I'm trying to think of who would be that angry at Lorca? And I, I, my brain is not coming up with any theories right now just because I just watched the episode. I'm sure I could probably think of someone. The biggest theory I had was it was Culber, but Culber that wouldn't be that pissed at Lorca. I mean, obviously Lorca is the one that placed him in the situation in the mirror universe, but I feel like he would be more angry at Voke rather than Lorca. So I don't think it's Culber. I, I doubt that. It might be Prime Universe Lorca, now that I'm thinking about it. Maybe Prime Universe Lorca was put out of the way by Mirror Lorca, and that's why Prime Lorca's pissed off. It's, that's, might be a little bit more of a stretch, but that's all I can really think of. I'm like, who else would be super pissed at Lorca? I mean, a lot of people, but no one that I can really think of specifically. If you have any thoughts, please comment below. I'd love to see some theories of who you think May actually is. And that's pretty much it for this episode overall. It's just a lot of teeing stuff up, getting people into positions. Um, it was cool to also see the return of Emperor Georgiou and sort of seeing that she's not in charge anymore. I'm curious to see how that dynamic goes. How, like, she's working for Section 31, and I thought she would be in the charge of her own ship but actually she's an underling on Section 31. Also, quick comment, does everyone kind of know about Section 31? Because in the 24th century, no one knows about it. And like, now it's just kind of like, Ash, I was like, yeah, I heard about black badges, but I never really believed it. Is it like, like a generally common knowledge, like a folklore type of thing? Because I was under the impression that no one knew, not even like whisperings of Section 31. So maybe some, maybe some interesting uh, mistakes in canon there, but who cares? Um, I'm not a huge canon law person. I also did like the fact that uh, Pike uses screens over the holograms. Again, that might be a little trying them fixing canon. Um, but yeah, overall, the episode felt like people moving things into place, kind of getting stuff set up for the rest of the season and giving us a little bit of exposition uh, and then mixing it in with some really interesting character stuff. And I really feel like the only major story beats going on with the stuff in the Klingon Empire was the, sort of the really big crux of this episode and even that kind of felt like moving people into place. But it was really nice to kind of get a lot of like inter-Klingon politics which we got some of on shows like Deep Space Nine but didn't really get a ton of overall in Star Trek. Overall good episode but doesn't stand strongly on its own. Um, but really intriguing setup for future episodes. That's it for this review. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you like this review and wanna see more Star Trek videos or more videos about geek topics or queer topics, because I'm also part of the LGBTQ community, please consider giving my channel a subscribe. I'm gonna be doing weekly Star Trek Discovery reviews of every episode right here on my channel every Thursday and new videos about completely other stuff or even Star Trek Discovery topics every Friday. 
So please consider giving my channel a subscribe. Other than that, just comment below. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this episode, and I will see you on the next review. Live long and prosper.